All right, so um, like I told you guys last week, we have one last heavy duty night, all right? And that's tonight, heavy duty, all right? We got a lot to cover, lots of topics. Really, we have four topics to cover, but if we can get through tonight, um, then really I feel like it's kind of smooth sailing for the rest of the course. Um, next week, we have a, just a super interesting single topic. Um, and that's going to be true for the rest of our time together. Single topics, just focusing on one specific thing for an evening. But tonight, I kind of baked in a whole lot. Okay, so buckle your safety belts, all right? Um, here's what I want to talk about tonight. So the first topic I want to talk about is what happens inside of an organization when you don't have everybody on the same page or not everybody is a believer? Okay, I'm not talking about in the Lord, I'm talking about in, in branding. What happens when you don't have everybody that like drinks the Kool-Aid and believes that the stuff that we're learning in this class matters to the organization? So that's the first thing we're gonna talk about. The second thing we're gonna talk about is one of the most important things you can talk about in marketing, which is integrated marketing. Um, and in a nutshell, that simply means, and it's gonna sound like such common sense, Get all of your forms of marketing to match, okay? Like, for example, if our company is running, let's say, a TV campaign, and that our company is also doing a direct mail campaign, they should be the same thing. Okay, sounds super common sense to you, but you wouldn't believe how many companies mess this up because they're so big and um, they, they have a hard time coordinating all the different marketing that they're gonna do. So we're gonna talk about that. The third thing we're gonna talk about tonight is something I mentioned to you already. Creating the total brand experience. And what I wanna talk about is things like, have you ever gone to a concert? Because a concert, a good concert, not a lame concert, a good concert, is honestly one of the best examples of total brand experience because it's multi-sensory, right? It's the artists getting to showcase themselves in like a multi-sensory way. So we're gonna talk about that. And then the last thing I've been threatening you all with for the last 10 weeks or so is the rat's tail and the McDonald's french fries. <laughs> Have we not talked about this a few times yet? Um, so I'm gonna finally show you the rat's tail. We're gonna talk, actually you I wanna- before that to those of us who still wanna eat Absolutely, yes, yes. And honestly, are you, are you gonna show us a picture of the rat? I'm gonna show you the rat tail, but honestly, the reality of it was that it was planted there. It wasn't McDonald's fault. It was like one of these like um, superfluous- uh, You didn't say that in any of the build-up. I know, because it makes it much more exciting, and, and, mm -hmm. and right? No, actually somebody put it there, but it still was a crisis nonetheless. I'm also gonna show you a pretty gross video from Domino's Pizza. Um, maybe you remember this a while ago. There was a, a YouTube kind of hoax that caused a lot of problems for Domino's. And we're gonna talk about that in terms of like what are the steps for crisis management? When something bad happens to your brand, what are you supposed to do? That's the last thing we're gonna talk about tonight, okay? Um, does anybody have a little handout with four questions? And somebody asked me already, no, this is not a quiz, and no, you don't know any of this stuff just yet, but you will, I promise, okay? You will know this stuff tonight. Um, so I'm gonna refer to this sheet a few times. You guys are gonna be um, answering some questions as we go through the material. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, chapter 12, all right? So let me ask you guys a question. How many of you work? Let's start there. How many have a job, a J-O-B? I'm not my J-O-B, right? N-O-W, right? Um, <laughs> To the extent of your knowledge, okay, do you think that you work for a brand building organization? What I'm asking is, do you think, to the extent of your knowledge, that your company, the company that you work for, believes in actively managing the brand, the image, the perception to the public, or not? Raise your hand if you feel like, yes, I feel like I work for a brand building organization. Raise your hand if you don't think that you work for a brand building organization. And raise your hand if you honestly don't know. You don't know where your, where your company is. Okay, 
So as we go through the chapter, I want you guys to weigh in on what your attitudes are about your own companies. Um, you know, do you feel like there's a boardroom full of people who are like, we well, ain't spending money on this bullshit and you know, we're not gonna invest in this stuff and this is not important and this doesn't create direct profit, so we're not gonna invest. Think about that as we go through it, okay? So one of the most difficult tasks is getting the organization to go from one that does not understand. That's the big thing we're gonna talk about tonight. That they don't believe in the stuff we're learning in this class, okay? And you can read in this chapter, and damn it, I forgot my book. Hopefully one of you has it, because we're gonna use it a couple times. Anybody have a book? Here you go. Okay, good. I'm gonna to get to you in a minute. Um, we'll share, okay, Carla? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, where was I going? Oh. <laughs> so many people, especially CFOs, what is a CFO? Chief They're often the biggest poo pooer on all things branding. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the CFO is sometimes the biggest naysayer? Right. Exactly. Right? Because they don't often see a really quick direct correlation between making profit and spending money on branding initiatives. Because it doesn't always drive profit immediately, okay? So we wanna go from that type of organization to one that embraces and actively builds a brand um, that, you know, that has a competitive advantage and speaks about it, tells stories about it to, to the audience. Okay, so I don't care whether you are the receptionist, whether you are some paper pusher in the human resources department. I think that everything that we're learning in this class can apply to you, I really do. Because, I mean, even from like HR, right? HR, think about HR. Why are we talking about HR in a marketing class? Think about HR. They're brand ambassadors, are they not? Every single candidate that comes into a company, their first impression is HR. If, if HR doesn't drink the Kool-Aid, if they don't speak brand on brand, then man, how many, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people are they giving the wrong story to, right? So I think branding starts in HR. I think it starts with receptionists. I think it starts with any kind of internal emails and communication that we have. I think it boils down to, you know, not even the obvious stuff like <clears throat> our product and our packaging and things like that, okay? So my point here is, is that branding affects all components of the company, no matter how uh, disconnected you think it is from, from, from the marketing department, I think there's a relationship, okay? So, until everybody from the CEO to the receptionist can accurately articulate the brand's promise, how do you expect customers to? Um, you ever interact with somebody at a company who doesn't drink the Kool-Aid? The quickest way to tell is when you have somebody in a company say something like, um, I don't know, they do this. They talk about the company like they're not a part of it. You ever experience that? Oh, I don't know, how could they, they, you know, well, what they're doing this week or this, they do. Don't you work here? <laughs> All right. The, the company hands on your paycheck too, right? So until everybody can really articulately, uh, I'm not articulate right now, articularly, <laughs> communicate what the brand is supposed to stand for, how do you expect the customer's gonna have a clear idea of what the brand is, all right? So that's that piece. Um, I'll say it again, everything from having like a clear mission statement to the culture. Have I ever told you my old Navy story? No. Have I ever told you my old Navy story? So I, my very, uh, one of my internships in college that led to one of my first big boy jobs after college was that Banana Republic catalog which doesn't exist anymore. And um, we were on the fifth floor of a big corporate building and our floor was Banana Republic catalog and part of our floor was the Old Navy design team. So the actual like product developers and designers. I will never forget as an intern, I always tell this story. My boss had sent me to like the mail room or something on the other side of the floor. And I go to the other side of the floor and there are all these like, I'm telling you, New York City, like super hipsters and like slick, like black outfits with like hipster glasses and like just like chic 
fabulous people. And I go back to my boss, I'm like, who are those people on the other side of the floor? Oh, that's the Old Navy design team. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? And I think that's such a great example of an internal corporate culture. These are latte sipping, you know, Warby Parker glasses wearing, I'm trying to build a stereotype, but they were the design team at Old Navy. Do you get it, right? Do you get what my confusion was as, as a young intern? The culture didn't really match the brand. You get what I'm saying, right? What would you expect to see in an Old Navy design team, a product development department in an office? Yeah, it doesn't have to be Old Navy merchandise, but you'd expect the, the lifestyle to be casual, right? Relaxed, like you expect people to be kind of young and casual and, right? And it, well, it just, it was so confusing to me, I didn't understand that sometimes the internal corporate culture doesn't necessarily match what's happening in the external customer facing component of the brand. Get my point here? But it's so much of a stronger um, thing when those things match, okay? I'll tell you guys, when I worked for Ralph Lauren in corporate, and we didn't really set foot in stores very often at all. I, I did, but most of my counterparts didn't. People really drank the Kool-Aid. You looked the part, you were a, you, you know, you could tell that you worked at that company, okay? And the culture really reflected it. Two polar examples. Okay, so everything, even things like um, performance appraisal. So how many of you have ever received like a formalized year-end review or a six-month review at your companies, yeah? Companies that take branding seriously will dedicate a piece of a performance appraisal to how well you are. And this may, may tell me if this sounds too like cutthroat for you, but how good a brand carrier you are. How, how much you have contributed to the marketing, to the messaging, to the brand storytelling, okay? Um, and Ralph Lauren, I mean, literally, I, I, not to brag, I won an award, a business development award for this very thing. It was basically like, here, thank you, you drank the Kool-Aid and the most of it. Like you drank the gallon worth of Kool-Aid, okay? But companies that want people to drink the Kool-Aid recognize and reward and appraise and even like financially incentivize people if they make those kind of contributions. Okay, I told you guys this story last week and I told it to you like I had already told it to you, not realizing that it was actually in tonight's lecture. So you guys tell me the story. What happened? at United Airlines a while ago. I wanna show you a little 30 second, it's an old, old, old um, TV commercial. 30 second, a beautiful TV commercial, but just so inappropriate for what was happening. What was going on at United? Who remembers? You mean like the engine failure and like, or? Um, it wasn't anything like technical at the oh. time. Okay. No. Was it, wasn't it how the dogs got lost or killed No. That's not bad. Not sure, but I don't even want to know that story. I know, right? But I can tell you're doing your research for your final project. Yeah. Uh, do you know what we're saying? Like they weren't allowing like specific type of people dressed a certain way. Uh, I don't even know that. Go Jesus does unite not a lot of problems. <laughs> We're on a baggage. Yeah. Okay. So all of those things I'm sure happened. What about Here's the overbooking of flights? Was that United? I don't know. Was there about the name change in there? No. Like no, but. But okay, we're getting close now. Okay, let me just tell my story then, all right? So United had hired a big fancy ad agency to develop a brand new series of beautiful uh, marketing campaign. Print, broadcast, web, everything, okay? And the message behind the campaign was, at United, we're rising. Rising. Get it? Rising. What do you think of when you think of rising? What is rising? Okay. This literally or or figuratively? Okay, fine. Both. Sure. This an airplane rises, but at the company we're rising. What does that mean? The customer service. Great. Okay. Beautiful. All right. So let me just show you this quick ad, and then I'm going to tell you the problem with the whole damn thing. Okay? Quick 30 second commercial. It's old and it's really blurry, so you can't appreciate how beautiful the videography is, but it really is a beautifully shot ad. Those of you um, discount people will, will appreciate it. Um, in, in each of the sets, there's a plane going up. Why 
Rising is astonishing. Rising is borderless and big. Rising is go. Rising is unstoppable. Rising is performance. Rising is leading the way. United is working to make air travel everything you want it to be. United. Okay, so United is rising, United is great, United is making airline flights, everything you want to be. Meanwhile, there's a strike going on inside the company because flight attendants are pissed, right? So they're literally like walking off the job. The customer service at the company had been down, 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 down for like years. And so there were a lot of like internal problems inside the company. Okay, so how do you get an external company to develop this beautiful campaign, print, broadcast, web, you put it out there, the message is we're great and getting better. That's great. But then inside the company, it's not that case at all. Okay, to make matters worse, you remembered last week, um, where am I? A consumer advocacy group started a website. Take a look at the second one. Just the T and the I are switched. Untied.com. And it was like, let's rant about every freaking horrible experience we've ever had on United Airlines. It's kind of brilliant. And it looked just like United Airlines website, okay? Um, so my point is, is that how are you a brand building organization if you invest all this money in pretty packaging, right? But it doesn't really reflect what's happening actually inside your company with your training, with your customer service, with your pay, with the way you're treating your employees, with what's happening with your union relations, right? What a horrendous waste of investment in marketing when the internal stuff should have been fixed first. Agree? So. The point here is, is that if you're gonna be a brand building organization, the message that you put out to the consumer has gotta match what's actually happening inside. It's gotta be good tasting cooling that we're going to, that we're going to uh, uh, promote, okay? All right, you know, once I play the video, right? <laughs> okay, so that's United Rising. All right. How do we get everybody on the same page? Step one, CEO's gotta buy in, all right? If you have a CEO who is outspoken against branding initiatives, who doesn't believe in marketing, who doesn't believe in integrated marketing, the thing we're gonna talk about in the next chapter, man, that's being in a up shit's creek without a paddle, I guess, right? Because um, if you don't have support at the top, that's a tough spot to be in. The second thing is the Kool-Aid, the culture. Does everybody understand what corporate culture is? The internal, I'll, I'll give you a few words, the internal vibe, you know, I'm feeling a vibe, right? I gotta tell you guys, anytime I go on a job interview, and it has been a while, don't spread rumors, I've not been on a job interview in a while, the very first thing I'm interested in is what is the culture here, right? What is the internal personality here, right? And does it match the external, you, what you would think the brand stood for, okay? So there's that. We have to make sure that the corporate culture reflects what the brand is supposed to be standing for. Um, you have to have people from lots of different areas drink the Kool-Aid, right? Support the brand initiative from lots of different perspectives. Uh, the HR department should not be saying, that's not my role. It is their role. The receptionist should not be saying, that's not my role. It is his or her role, right? It's everybody's role. Everybody somehow contributes to the culture and, and, and then the brand, okay? So that is kind of some of the organizational support factors. Most important, the top dog, right? When you don't have the top dog support, it becomes an uphill battle, all right? Um, especially from a budget perspective, all right? It's the biggest thing. Okay, how we doing? Everybody good? Y'all? Sweet, what are we talking about tonight? For Dominique's benefit? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having a book tonight. What are we talking about tonight? In plain English? Building brand organizations. How? Getting everybody on the same page with inside the company so everybody can articulate what the brand is supposed to stand for. Go ahead. No, I was just saying like the experience throughout the brand, so internally. Great, 
the internal experience should match the external experience. What we want the customer to experience is what employees should communicate. Great. Where does support start? The top. Yeah. CDO, CFO, right? Whoever controls the, po the purse strings. HR from, a, from the perspective of disseminating the brand down to external uh, uh, interviewees, and then also the training and everything else. Okay, good. Okay, let's answer the first question on my little roadmap for tonight. So you've got four questions in front of you, one for each of the four topics we're gonna talk about. So here's the first one for this one. Which common, by the way, don't forget to name, write your name on this, so I don't have to do a guessing game later, please. Which common organizational barrier, roadblock, problem, okay, uh, to brand building do you believe is the hardest to get over? So I've got two slides on this. I'll just take you through it quickly. I think I have two slides. One, one, no, one slide. I'll take it through quickly. I want to know in your opinion, which do you think is a deal breaker? Which do you think is kind of a career suicide if you're running the marketing department at a company? Which one would you least like to have to encounter and deal with? Okay, let me take you through them quickly. Barriers. Senior management not really being focused on the brand. Senior management not really supporting, giving resources, <laughs> resources. What's the most important resource we need? Money. Money. Um, senior leaders not believing in brand management. Uh, the organization being highly fragmented, highly broken up. Not a lot of like cooperation or, or uh, cross communication between departments. Organization is internally focused. You don't really care about external public relations, about the image, about they care inside, but they don't care about what's happening outside. Um, difficulties making people focus from functional silos. I do HR, I don't care about marketing, that's not my job. I'm just the receptionist. What can I do about the company's brand image, right? Getting people to shift from functional silos to cross-functional ownership of the brand that every department somehow contributes to the brand building, okay? Um, the culture doesn't reinforce the brand, my old lady example. Can't have a room full of slick ass dressed hipsters and head to toe black with the Warby Parker glasses understanding the old lady consumer. But they did. But they did. Yes. Yes. You, you, Landis, you bring up a really good point. At the end of the day, actually, that was some of Old Navy, Ed Gap, and Banana's best years. So, good point. All right? Um, operations and systems don't really support the brand. And the brand message is just a myriad of corporate messages. We're just one brand in a million brands in this company, and maybe we don't matter as much. Okay? Take a second. Think about what. Do you, there's no, obviously there's no right or wrong answer, I just want your opinion. Which do you think is the biggest deal breaker, the biggest barrier, the biggest roadblock, the one that you would hate to have to overcome inside your organization the most? That's what I'm asking you for number one, and why? Tell me which one you're choosing, but then why? Why do you think this one sucks the worst? are done with our first topic. Each of them are short sound bites. I just have a lot of them. One down, four to go. Almost perfect attendance tonight. That's awesome. Right. Give me that head nod when you are ready for me to move on. No head nods? I got, I got two, all right. Yeah, three, four, 
Give you guys a couple more minutes to breathe. 30 seconds. And by a couple minutes, I mean 30 seconds. Has everybody selected their biggest barrier? While you guys are finishing up your response, I'm going to draw on the board um, something that I drew on the board, I believe, on the first night of class. And it was a giant umbrella. Did I put a giant umbrella on the board on the first night of class? Yeah. I did? Great. Good. I'm a good, I'm a good marketing teacher then. Okay? Giant umbrella. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yes? Do yes? yeah. you remember my masterful artwork? Yeah. All right. So this is the marketing umbrella. Okay, so this topic, you guys, really simple. It's such a simple, there are entire books written about this, there are entire college courses written about it. I'm gonna explain this to you in a nutshell in about two minutes, all right? And, and, and companies like AT&T screw this up literally season after season. But here's the marketing umbrella, okay? Spell that right? Yeah. Give me examples of forms of marketing. What types of marketing exist? Advertisements, right? Any type of advertisements. Digital okay. marketing. So digital is a tough one because within digital, we will have all the different media. forms of marketing. So digital is not its own like standalone. Okay, thing. social media. Um, same. Right. Same. Hold those two until we get all our words up here, and then I'll show you how these words would fit into both digital and social. Sampling. Like when you sample a product. Oh, okay, great. Promotions. Yeah. And promotions could be anything from coupons to giveaways to samples to contests to like, you know, the Monopoly game at McDonald's. What else you got? Trade, trade shows. Great. The gorilla market? Sure. Trade shows. <clears throat> gorilla. And it's not spelled like the animal, it's spelled G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. Gorilla marketing. Okay, what else you got? Partnerships. Um, That's another one that could be a lot of things. Like one example of a partnership would be two companies sharing the cost of an ad. It's cooperative advertising. That's advertising, okay? But let me just answer my own question. Public relations, yeah? Yes. And direct marketing. These are the major forms of marketing. And while I'm on the topic, let's just get this umbrella up there too, okay? So a lot of this type of stuff, event marketing, here's your social media, okay? And, you know, but uh, here's the deal. Let me just address social media and, and, and digital media, all right? So when you log on to, what are you guys on these days besides the gram? Pinterest. Pinterest. I love Pinterest. I love Pinterest. I can wait. <laughs> you guys, I mean, I'm like, I've been sitting on the toilet for 40 months. This is yeah. great. <laughs> so I'm not again. Yeah. Yeah. Pinterest is great. Graham's great. What else are you guys on these days? Anybody? I really use Twitter. Yeah? I know you guys. I know you guys. Twitter is fandoms. Yeah. So totally. Totally. Twitter is it's a great. It's a million different things and I have two different accounts for it, but. It's a great passive experience, right? It's like, do, do you interact? I think that's really a fandom thing yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. If you have a lot of stuff in common with people, you should talk more. I get that. I totally get that. Although, the typical Twitter user, of course, is like super passive, right? It's just kind of a, a likely. But anyway, okay, so my point about social media and digital is when you surf Instagram, there's basically two types of media you're looking at. You're either looking at public relations, right? That is that organic, post and sharing of things, or you're looking at advertising, that's the paid spots, whether that be from an influencer or whether it be at an actual pay space. So social media itself is not necessarily like a form of marketing, but it incorporates advertising and public relations. That's my view. Okay, so let me just sum up this entire, sum up an entire book for you in a couple of sentences, all right? Think about a giant company like AT&T. And I use them because they're a really good example of ethanism, right? Think about AT&T. Okay, so what types of marketing does AT&T do? And you all know AT&T, yeah? AT&T cellular, AT&T uh, landline, AT&T 
uh, cable, UVerse, and, and the internet. Okay, so there's all these components, right? All right, so they do ads. What kind of advertisements do they do? Commercial. TV broadcast, radio, digital, all right, and print. Oh, no, the mail, the mailers. That's not advertising. Oh, okay. We'll go there in a second. Print. You can still open a newspaper and a magazine and see AT&T ads. I see them in Real Simple. I like, I'm such a girl. I love Real Simple. Do you all like Real Simple magazine? Yeah. The Muppet. Like the oh, Muppet I, I see a billboard here and there. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Outdoor. Thank you for adding that. Print, digital, broadcast, outdoor. Okay. Great. You go home tonight, Dominique, and you go to your mailbox and you have an AT&T mailer, that's direct marketing, okay. right? This is paid media space, this is no media space. Okay. That, that mailer that came to you, it came to you, it's not media. It's a direct message that they produce to you, okay? Then they do lots and lots and lots of PR, okay? Lots of trying to place AT&T in, in uh, articles and coverage and social media and all this kind of stuff, PR. Okay. And then they do pl plenty of trade shows and promotions and I bet they do Google. Okay, what's my point? in this chapter. I'll tell you. Yeah. They're so big that there isn't one or two agencies that can do all of this work for them. So they have lots and lots of agencies. When they do outdoor advertising, it's one agency. When they do the print mailers, it's one agency. When they do print and broadcast, it's another agency. Uh, when they do trade shows, it's another third party company. And what do you think you get? Advertising. Yeah, you get a whole bunch of different messages, okay? And here's what else you get. A really inconsistent use of the most basic freaking graphic design that you've all learned, like treatment of the logo. Okay, so let me stop for one second, if you don't mind. I want to show you another huge committer of the sin. The sin of not integrating your marketing. And this sinner, we're going to talk about them a couple times tonight, is Mickey D's. Let's look at this article. Mickey D's. Do you know why McDonald's has such a hard time integrating their marketing? Because they're big. That's a really good answer. I like simple answers because they're really big. Who's doing the advertising? Thousands and thousands of local independent owner operator franchises. And guess what? It's really hard to control when you've got thousands of people doing the advertising for you. I'm not talking about just like the national TV campaign that comes, you know, from the ad agency. I'm talking about all the little local go on social media. Every single local McDonald's has a Facebook page. McDonald's number 703. And they're they're funny as shit, let me just tell you. You, I love when I read things like, I went to my local McDonald's and they only gave me one milk or one ketchup. I'm like, first of all, which McDonald's? There's 7,000 of them. So your, your complaint is a complete waste of time people because- People write on the Walmart Facebook page, where is the bathroom? Like all the old people? Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, okay, let's start with which one of the 3,000 are you at? Anyway, let me read this to you real quick, okay? You deserve a redesign today. How McDonald's took a page from, do you all know Marie Kondo? Mm -hmm. I love if you don't know Marie Kondo, you need a little Marie Kondo in your life. <laughs> she will teach you how to fold the shirts in your drawer. Can we just talk about this for a second? <laughs> life changer. Literally, you never, you didn't know how to fold a shirt until you need Marie Kondo. Am I not kidding? She will teach you how to show, fold a shirt in your drawer and it will change your life. I'm not. Marie Kondo, right there in the article. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, for the everyday customer, the name McDonald's might summon up a handful of singular images. The Golden Arch is a Big Mac, a red container of fries, Ronald McDonald. Okay, that's pretty safe. Uh, or a rat's tail if you're in John Conti's class. Okay? <laughs> but just two years ago, if you surveyed the company's advertising around the world, you would find a completely different picture. Jumbled messages comprising a mishmash, I like that, of fonts. I can't stand when you guys turn a paper into me and your freaking term paper has more than one font. Like pick a font and stick to it for Christ's sake, right? And if you're an advertiser, 
why aren't you using the approved corporate font? All right, so a mishmash of fonts, a color palette pulled from the entire rainbow, like who are we, Skittles? <laughs> um, and an assortment of logos. How could that be? That's the problem with that McDonald's set out to correct last year with a comprehensive overhaul of the company's global visual identity. The chain is massive. Oh my God, 35,000 restaurants in 120 countries around the world, 17,000 in the US alone. Given that breath, a chaotic visual identity chips away at the brand. Its mandate was to further CEO Steve Easterbrook's mission to make McDonald's a modern, progressive burger company. Skip to the next paragraph. To become more contemporary, Mitchell's team, working with the chief marketing officer, Sylvia, don't make me say that last name, Lanyando, <laughs> dug into the past. We had the vision around feel-good marketing. The idea was very simple. At its best, McDonald's is more than just burgers and fries. The team took inspiration from You Deserve a Break Today campaign from 1971. Um, Neil, Neilam Harper and Steer is a, obviously an ad agency in Chicago and decided it wanted to bring a joyful legacy to every consumer interaction, including the design. Okay, go down to the next paragraph. Turner Duckworth broke the project down into three steps. Decluttering, <laughs> watch an episode of Marie Kondo and that's her whole thing, right? Decluttering your house. Uh, does this bring you joy? <laughs> <laughs> if it brings you joy, you keep it. If it doesn't bring you joy, you throw it away. Yes? All right. Um, identifying latent opportunities that weren't already being mined. Oh, I, I skipped one. And highlighting what's already stand out about the brand, in, introducing feel-good moments. Okay, so just to recap the rest of the article, archery, McDonald's golden arches are the cornerstone of the new identity used simply, dynamically, and playfully throughout brand communications. So we're gonna see lots of playing with like even a little piece of the arch because it's known so well, we don't even have to show the whole damn thing, right? So even a little piece of the arch, people understand what it is. Um, under the new design rules, the iconic arches are free to stand on their own. Previously, they had to be locked with the word mark. So anytime you saw the arch, it had to say McDonald's. That's not true anymore because the McDonald's arch is so, it's like the Starbucks, um, what do we call her again? Siren, right? Used to be that always the word Starbucks was underneath her and that's not the case anymore because it's so iconic, right? When a brand is that strong and it can stand alone, you guys, when I worked for Nautica, we had our sailboat logo with the word Nautica and we took the Nautica off, nobody knew what the hell it was. Because internally we were so pompous and we thought we were the shit, um, but we were a little bit past the peak. We used to be bigger than the polo pony, and it was a bad move. You needed the word Nautica attached to the to the art to the uh, to the to the cell yeah, level. Okay. Anyway, was there anything else I want to tell you about? Just if, if, those of you who are typography nerds, I love typography. I, I pay attention to fonts. They say a lot. They can communicate a brand in a nutshell. Um, McDonald's now is just a single font, Speedy. I like that Speedy, and there it is on the left. Speedy bold, speedy regular, speedy light. Okay, I'll stop right there. You guys, just picking the font and making everybody stick to a font alone will help integrate the marketing. Does everybody understand what integrated marketing is? Yes? It is one consistent, unified message and design aesthetic across whatever the hell it is we're doing. Advertising, public relations, our website, promotions, direct marketing, whatever it is, one message. Not so easy to achieve, but at least in theory, it's what we want to aspire to, no matter how big we are, okay? I'm gonna give you an example. Everybody good? Good, good, good? Okay, example, trade show. I think a trade show is such a perfect example of an opportunity to really get this right and not screw it up, okay? Magic, you guys all know magic? Yes, yes or no? No. So, magic started out, do you all know what magic stands for? This is a little like side note. Games of Carol. Yes, um, do you remember this from my buying class? Mm -hmm. I'm, I am thrilled. I just remember Games of Carol. I am thrilled. Magic stood for 
Men's Apparel Group in California. And the brand name could not be more wrong today. Why, you ask? Because it is no longer just men's, and it is no longer in California, right? It grew, it outgrew. Yeah, correct. For years and years and years, it outgrew the city that it used to be in Palm Springs, California, one of my favorite places on the face of this earth, Coachella, yeah? Um, that, men's Apparel Group in California. So, Magic is the largest trade show in fashion. It is, how many of you have been? Anyway, I'm surprised. I usually always have like a couple. It is mind blowing, okay? Picture our little dinky 12th floor in the, the World Trade Center, the temporaries. Picture it across the entire Mandalay Bay Convention Center in Las Vegas. It is massive. Okay, let me just show you a quick teaser and then I'm gonna explain to you why a trade show is the perfect opportunity to really get integrated marketing down yeah. correctly. But first, a word from our sponsor. chance to go to really any trade show, if you have a chance to work market, I know a lot of you have, you cannot be a student at Wake College and not work market, okay? So you need to go do that and get that on your resume. How many of you have worked market? Here, Atlanta, anywhere? Okay. For the rest of you, you know, what the hell? Like, <laughs> we need to work on this, okay? You, you cannot be a Wake student grad and not get a market under your belt. But, can we think for a second, all right, about a trade show? What forms of marketing exist to get a trade show up and running and then at the trade show? Let's think about this for a second. You're a buyer. Let's get it from a buying perspective. You're a buyer, okay? You have a whole lot of vendors that really want you to come here and buy their shit. What kind of marketing do we need to produce? Public relations. Okay, a press release. Let's start there. We need to set a press release out that you know, we are such a designer, we're gonna be at Magic, our booth is 23569, come visit us, here's our new collection. Great, what else? Email. Great, I like that, you said that. Shavia? Uh, yes, Allison. Email. email, for sure. Have a straight up email campaign, right? Direct marketing to the businesses. Great, I love it, absolutely, why not? Why not? What's wrong with a postcard? What's wrong with a brochure or a lookbook? If we have the budget to print something nicer, right? What else you got? You can do like that with marketing. Uh, commercial. So commercial's tough. Like a, you say TV, TV commercial? Like probably like even like on YouTube or something. Sure. Great. I'm with you on that. YouTube's media. awesome and social media is awesome because we can really target the video content specifically to People who have buyer in their profile, people who work for a retailer, like it's easy, easier to target, right? Okay, what else you got, Scott? How about stuff like, okay, so we go to Vegas, we land in Vegas, um, you check into the Mandalay Bay, you get your room key. What's in the back of your room key? Oh, the advertisement. Or the TV when you turn on, you know? Yeah. Great. Elevator or, yeah. Great, keep going. Or how about uh, in the literal space? Right? Here's like, come visit us at booth 709, right? Here's what we sell, here's who we are. How about things like billboards in the city? You land in the, before you land, you see them freaking billboards. I see the Calvin Harris billboard, literally as I'm landing in Vegas, right? It's like, you know, so big. Um, okay, what else? I'm gonna cheat and go to the next slide and read some of this stuff to you. How about stuff like, how about stuff like, it freezes when I show a video. How about stuff like, 
The trade show booth itself. Direct mail, you guys said it. Email, Allison said it. Uh, how about print ads in the trade magazines? I don't know about you all, but I still read Women's Wear Daily at least once a week. I hope you do too. You're looking at me like, what? <laughs> we only spend like $5,000 to subscribe to the damn thing. You should be reading it. It's the Bible of, of the industry, right? Of men's and women's and home furnishings. You should be reading it. Uh, inserts, website announcements, trade press, um, hotel room key cards, ads in the convention center, outdoor space. Okay, what's the point? Let's bring it back to the point of this chapter. What's the point? Should I get five different ad agencies to develop all of this stuff? What is the goal here? One message. Integrate. Sure. One message, one design concept, one thing that we're promoting in one specific font and tone and color and visual voice and literal voice. Okay, so we, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse. We understand what integrated marketing is. How do we make it happen? If we're a little brand, it's not hard. How does a larger company make it happen? How does a McDonald's, we read a little bit, like, Choose a font and tell everybody to use the freaking font. <laughs> like, okay, great, that's a start. How do we make integrated marketing happen, especially if we're larger? I guess having rules for a certain thing. Good. Like the font would be one thing, but um, I know at my job we say like a certain thing, or if you go to Chick Fil A, you know, sure. it's my pleasure, whatever. It's just keeping certain rules for a certain thing. Good. Oh, you board. have like a, a brand voice, things that you say, yeah. right? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Script. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, it's, it's not enough just to have the rules, but then what do we do with the rules? Enforce them. Enforce them. Before we even enforce them, what do we need to do with the rules? Publish them? Yeah, communicate them, right? Have them somewhere, maybe in an, I don't know if this is an old school word or not, but in, in an intranet site. Do you all know what an intranet site is? Not internet, but an intranet site? Yeah, you got it, it's the internal companies. Database. database, good word, yep. How about we publish all these rules in an internal company database so that everybody can follow it, then we reinforce. And during orientations. Great, I love that. Because um, I know for me, like I cannot access the internet for where I work um, without actually using one of their physical computers. Great, and you learned that during orientation? No, I learned that because I was trying to get to the web page. On my phone. Right. Right. Yeah, and you can only get it through through yeah. company. I get that totally. Okay, so here is a recap of kind of the stuff that you guys said to me. Some of these are new. It's two pages long, but this is going to be question number two that we answer on our little sheet. So, why is this mechanism effective? State which one you are addressing. Okay, so my question to you is. How do we get integrated marketing to happen? And you said to me stuff like, create rules, publish them, and then enforce them, all right? What else do we have? Create a well-communicated brand positioning statement. Literally, a statement that says, here's who we are, here's what we stand for. Um, place a brand marketing visionary, a person. You know what we call this in fashion retailing? Neiman's has one, Macy's has one, Bar oh, Barney Barney's declared bankruptcy yesterday. Wow. Closing 15 oh, stores. Wow. Barney's had one of these. Nordstrom has one. What do we call the creative visionary in a fashion retailer? You guys don't know? Ken Downing. I thought it was CC, the chief creative officer. That's all yeah. I've seen. Yeah. In fashion, we have a specific title, fashion director. Ken Downing, you all remember him? Yeah. Ken Downing? Yeah. He was the fashion director of Neiman Marcus for a gazillion years. Yeah. Literally, gazillion years. Started as an assistant buyer. Yeah. All of Neiman Marcus's image came from him for like 20 years. Wow. Okay? He was the marketing visionary. Provide the chief marketing officer with a really broad span of control. Create a marketing plan. Develop an integrated media plan. 
So we understand and are controlling every single type of media we're in. Set up an inter intranet, talked about that. But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. Have lots of meetings, shit, that's like mm -hmm. common sense. Have lot, even if your people are across the country or the world, there's technology for that. Situate marketing people physically close together. Don't put your marketing people in different offices in different cities. Put them physically together. Um, put marketing people close to sales and product development and customer service. They can communicate, collaborate. What was the word you used? I was Communicate, collaborate, speak. Um, I can't, I'm having a brain fart on your name. I don't know. Oh, Aaliyah. Aaliyah said earlier that scripts. Yeah. You know that people at Chick-fil-A have a script, they have a little like jingle that they say. What's it, what is it? Like, um, it's, my it's my pleasure. It's really awkward. It's all, I, it's <laughs> You're like, you know, I hate you. It's my pleasure. The hotel that I go to <laughs> at Christmas, that's their thing, it's my pleasure, and literally like, they say it a thou, it's sick, they say it a thou, it's my pleasure, like, like, stop saying that. Okay, here's one, I don't. Can I say like you two or something? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah, you two. Revolver. Or me too, and I'm like. I love it. Okay, here's one, not feasible for really, really, really giant companies, but how about, just one company doing all your marketing so that it's the same graphic design, it's the same messaging, that they're communicating with each other. Okay, here's another one. Even if you can't use one agency, how about having one copywriter? What does a copywriter do? You got it, write words. And one graphic designer be the keepers of the brand voice. Or designate one brand management person to kind of enforce kind of what Landis was saying earlier, kind of to enforce the rules. Okay, so what I'm asking you in question number two is, in your opinion, you could choose any of them, and really, not, no wrong answer here. Of all of these things, which one would you like to argue is important, and why? They're all important. They all lead us to the same result, which is one consistent message, right? One font, one graphic design, one brand voice, one aesthetic. But what do you, which one do you think is really important and why? Okay, I'll keep switching back and forth so you can look at your options. Think of McDonald's as a, as a good example. They had to get their ducks in a row. All right, so question number two. Pick one of these, tell me why you think this one's a game changer. All right. Tell me when you got yours so I can move on to the next slide. Everybody good? Yes. Will that be? Yes. That's number two. Good? Mm -hmm. These are listed as your chance for this one. Okay, give you a good chance just to kind of give me the why behind it. You guys, we are sailing. Two topics down. Two to go. Check. All right. Give me that friendly. Nod when you have answered number two. Good? All right, cool. For the love of me, I do not know why these two topics are in one chapter. Because as far as I'm concerned, they have nothing to do with each other. Um, I guess the crisis management topic was maybe too short to sit in its own chapter, I don't know. But I'm gonna treat these as two totally separate topics even though they happen to live in the same chapter, okay? So, third topic we're gonna to talk about is creating the total brand experience. What example did I use a while ago? Go ahead. Vitamin water. Yeah, do you guys remember the vitamin water example, the pop-up store? That was pretty cool, right? 
super cute. It was very New York, very hip. And it was a chance for vitamin water to do what? Control the experience. Yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say? I want to say like the emotional connection. It's beautiful. Yes. It was a chance to really get an emotional connection with the consumer um, to kind of build whatever it was. Trust is probably not the emotion. It's probably more like admiration, if anything. Like, wow, they're cool. I admire that. Right? Okay. So that's the total brand experience. Um, I want to show you a quick, quick clip to a video. You all know. I'm a super supporter of Under Armour because I'm an investor and I pray that one day the company <laughs> can do something good for me. In the meantime, I will continue to talk about and promote Under Armour and you should all go buy yourself a pair of shoes. Um, but the title of this video is Every Experience is a Brand Experience. Okay? And it kind of makes a good point um, that it really doesn't matter what it is that you're putting in front of the customer, everything that the customer sees and does and touches and experiences, is, it's part of the total brand experience, no matter how small you think that thing is. Let me just show you some examples. Watch closely, there's not a lot of words, it's just kind of pictures. Oh, sucker. <laughs> that sucks. That experience is unavailable. <laughs> right, exactly. That was a terrible joke, I think. No, I don't know. <laughs> I tested this video and everything. Okay, you know what? I'll recap it for you. <laughs> Video's gonna show you things like um, you opening up the Starbucks app, placing the order for your coffee. That's a brand experience, right? Mm -hmm. You walk into a store, Under Armour store, and it smells a certain way. It, and it does. You guys all been to an Under Armour store? So it smells a certain way. A good smell. It's, it's, it's a fragrance. I guess they pump it through the system. It's part of the brand experience. Um, you getting served at a restaurant, the experience you have with the waiter, all part of the brand experience, okay? So what is the total brand experience? Well, it is this. And I've lost my remote control. Here it is. It's the product itself the service experience, it's the environment in which that thing is being sold, it's the corporate culture, and that's both the culture inside the office and inside the store, if, if, if the brand we're talking about is store, okay? It's the frontline employees, I could be talking about the sales associate, the receptionist, whatever you're talking about, and the, I'll add one word here, hopefully the integrated marketing. Okay, so let me give you an example, a good example, Starbucks. So, Starbucks provides, first of all, what do you think? This wow. is, um, this is a new retail design for Starbucks stores. They're rolling this concept out in South America and Europe which are two really tough markets for them because coffee is an ethnocentric product. Yeah? When you're in Europe, you drink? Tea. No. Wine. Other than Britain, yes. And you know what's funny? Young Brits are actually, for the first time, drinking more coffee than tea. But when you're in Europe, if you're an Italian, you drink Italian coffee. If you're French, you drink French coffee. If you're Spanish, you drink Spanish coffee. Um, it's a very ethnocentric product. And then South America, the same. You're Brazil, you drink Brazil. So to be an American coffee company breaking into those countries, very challenging thing to do, okay? It's like, you know, being Asian and trying to sell pizza in Italy. Tough thing to do, <laughs> all right? Or American, like, um, who would buy American pizza in Italy? So, I'm on a side, I'm on a tangent, but Starbucks, what does it create? What's their whole ethos when it comes to like the store environment? They like to use local materials, right? It's a very like tactile environment. There's lots of wood, you interior right. designers, right? It's, we're gonna read in a second about it. So anyway, here's the outside of the store. But the insides of the stores are always very reminiscent of like the local place that the, 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 that the Starbucks is in. Um, I'll just give you some examples. Here's that, that same concept again. I think it's super cool. Mm -hmm. Some people think it looks like, like a bad nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's the thing I wake up in the middle of like screaming from. I can't breathe, these like wood things. 
Um, there's another. I, I think it's beautiful, but and it's all reclaimed wood, and it's you know the whole. It's sustainable. Um, and then even on rail cars, Starbucks translate that same experience on a lesser scale because there's a lot less space to do it, but there's still a sense of that like coffee house cool um, from the culture. From the is anybody in here a Green Apron? They call their employees Green Aprons. Nobody. Nobody's ever been a barista. Okay. Um, but from the culture and the training, can't you always kind of pick out a Starbucks employee? Don't they always kind of have something about them that's like you're just so Starbucks barista? Yeah. Yes or no? I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> it's okay. We can stereotype a little bit. They're always a little what? I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what race they are too, they're all the same. They're like, there's just something a little hipster and a little like, you know, they're 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 copies. Okay. Um, <coughs> have you guys ever been to the Starbucks corporate office in Seattle? It's super cool. I went to the first one. Really? Like the first store, but not the corporate office. Oh yeah, yeah, in uh, Pike's Place, totally. So this is not far, it's actually just over the bridge. They have a Starbucks museum inside oh. the Starbucks corporate. It's open to the public, you can go. It's super cool, it's super Does cool. Does Will like that? Uh, yeah, they have a Starbucks too in it, of course. <laughs> and it's the best Starbucks in the world because hello, like the CEO goes there, right? Um, but, and then it's the product itself, it's the way the product smells, it's the experience that we have with the technology, and then it's also brilliant, right? It's also the public relations component, right? It's also the product getting baked into the culture Okay, lots of examples. Okay, let's read this, shall we? If you have your book, open up to page 188. I'll read. You know I love public reading. <laughs> One of you don't mind that I borrow? Go ahead. I love public reading. Anybody like 188, 188? Oh yeah. Yeah, did I get it right? I did. Um, anybody have that fear in school, like, dear God, please don't pick on me to read? Yeah? Struggle is real. Um, I was that person like, I'll read. Okay, so ultimately everything, product services, retail environment, corporate culture, frontline employees, marketing, and online presence, and I'll add to that the in-app experience, okay, must come together to create the total brand experience. Starbucks does this well. Not only is its product extraordinarily different from and better, that's reasonable, did I tell you guys my brother just got a new job um, working for Ely Coffee? Do you guys know the company Ely? Yeah. You know it? Yeah, it's a red logo. They're an Italian coffee brand. So of course my brother, now I'm saying this on YouTube, um, <laughs> thinks Starbucks is shit and how dare you drink Starbucks and like that's garbage and only Ely. Now I was in Europe a couple weeks ago and tell you Ely is like, it's on every corner, man. It is everywhere across Europe. Um, so. He would beg to differ about Starbucks being better than a normal cup of coffee. But everything else the company does also adds to the brand experience. The stores feature carefully crafted, aesthetically coordinated components. The smell of fresh brewed coffee, a wide variety of unusual blends, exotic names. I mean, even the language, let's, we take this for granted if you're a Starbucks, but like the sizes. You don't walk into a Starbucks and order a medium. What are you, like a heathen? <laughs> It's a grande, right? And Avente, you also know the short. Yeah, did you know the short? Yeah. Short is small. Well, I'm teaching you things tonight. I thought tall was tall. Uh, short is smaller than tall. Well, you learn something. Yeah, short short. Yeah. It's actually, yeah. <laughs> I know, the short is. <laughs> uh, you can get anything short. Yeah, so the short, tall, grande, venti, <laughs> and then there is Trenti. There's twenty. It's like extra, extra large. Yeah. People, I, I am a well useless knowledge. You haven't taken my branding class yet, and I also taught you about the Starbucks name. Yes. Where did it come from? Moby Dick. Character in the American novel Moby Moby Dick. Moby Dick. Okay. So. The language, the fresh pastries, the jazz music, the wing chairs, the fireplace, sometimes live, oh, some of them do. The live music, sometimes the functional but stylish lighting. Um, we, in our interior design program, we had a professor 
a couple of years ago who was a corporate interior designer for Starbucks. She was the coolest, she could have been a barista. She was the coolest person. And she'd tell us a lot about how they would choose a lot of the materials, um, sophisticated sign graphics, stylish merchandise, and so on. Starbucks store designers must first, oh, here's a story about her. Starbucks and store designers must first work behind the counter for a while to get better understanding of the store in-store experience. And their employees, called partners, receive extensive brand and customer service training and stock options to ensure the quality of the customer service experience in the store. Each employee receives a document called, how cute is this, the Green Apron Book, which they're expected to keep inside their Green Apron. It's like a little white mini Bible. Aww. I know, either that's cute or like super creepy. Um, a booklet that fits into the pocket of the barista's apron, filled with tips and insights about how to provide an uplifting experience that enriches people's daily lives. What does that sound like? That's almost like their brand essence. Beautiful. Oh, okay, the brand essence. Yes, and, and, and ultimately results in emotional connection to the brand. The company's website devotes space to the history and the mystique of coffee brewing. Starbucks delivers an, affor uh, an affordable, we could debate that, indulgent experience. Everything is designed to make you feel sophisticated in a warm, inviting way. Buy a cup of Starbucks coffee and you are swept away from the ordinary for a while. Do you all know about Starbucks's third place philosophy? Yes or no? Star one of Starbucks' big internal mantras is the third place. Well, what are the first two places? Home, Home work, oh, okay. church. <laughs> Not this generation. Home, work, Starbucks. Their whole thing is that they want to be the third place in people's lives. Okay, I know that sounds as like as aggressive as Coca-Cola being from every faucet in the world, right? Or what is it from an arm's length and you know, everybody in the world. But that's the full mantra. I wrote the previous paragraphs for the first edition of this book. Since then, Starbucks has experienced a long period of rapid growth through new store openings, geographic expansion, new product development, um, selling Starbucks products with new channels, including five airlines, retail formats, including Express, which caters to the grab-and-go customer. This demonstrates the problem of growing successful brands. Starbucks products are now available in environments, just like Landa said earlier about smart water, in which the company can no longer control the brand experience. True? Um, let's look for a second, just back at one picture real quick. So here's a brand new outlet. I know real travel is not huge for us, but it definitely is in places like Europe. A brand new method of retail for Starbucks, but in an environment they have a lot less control over. Agree? Right? It is not develop, delivering the total brand experience the way Starbucks is accustomed to. So what do you do? Now let's keep reading. On an airline, for example, a passenger may get a cup of Starbucks coffee, but its preparation probably doesn't follow the company's brewing guidelines and it's served to a passenger in a cramped seat on a crowded airplane on one of the least comfortable places to enjoy a cup of coffee. Does this experience fit with the Starbucks brand? No. No, I mean, there's no argument there, no. Um, to continue on the growth trajectory, decisions are often made that detract from the intended brand experience. Is Starbucks still about the special third place experience or is it just another ubiquitous brand in mass appeal, with mass appeal? To answer this question, let's look at an example provided by a customer ex expert, Mark Gobey. I think I showed you a Mark Gobey video a while ago in his book, Emotional Branding, The New Paradigm for Correct Connecting People to Brands. At one point in Starbucks history, the company's financial managers determined that switching from, this is hilarious, I, yes, we're going to talk about toilet paper, <laughs> switching from two-ply to one-ply toilet paper in Starbucks bathroom would save the company like I, I think I read like millions of dollars a year, just, just downgrading the toilet paper. And the CEO said no. Um, he literally said no, because Starbucks promises a great coffee experience, and in order to do that, it takes more than a barista and a menu of coffee drinks, it takes satisfaction, let me read this to you, really important, at all touch points. Creepy, gross pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, if you go into a high-end brand and they have things like cheap toilet paper or cheap soap or cheap tissues or cheap whatever, it leaves an impression on you. It's a touch point. Yes or no? Yeah. Um, how about, what's his name? How many of you came to my Niven Morgan field trip a couple weeks ago, right? And he was, how many of you came? 
Pippin Morgan. You don't know, he's a high-end re- uh, wholesaler of light candles and, and, and bath products. And he said that the, all the hotel business he does, it's shit, it does no profit. He basically breaks even on it, but he wants his products to be in hotels because it delivers for these luxury hotels a nice experience. You have this like niche designer product and it eventually creates sales for him later. And the hotels want it because there's nothing worse. Oh, yes, there's things worse. But there's nothing worse than like gross hotel products, right? Or like the gross public restroom soapies. Yeah, like the soft soap, like the generic soft yeah, soap, right? Yeah. No, it just, no. it screams, you know that chemical yeah. stuff. Yeah. It screams of a lowering experience. Mm-hmm. It's at a touch point. Bathrooms, you interior designers, I think you'll agree. They're an important touch point in service-based business, like, re- re- like retail, restaurant. A good bathroom with good products, they speak to the consumer. They're part of the, what is this chapter? Um, you got it. Got it, sisters and brothers. Uh, okay, I'm done with that. That's all I wanted to read to you. Gracias. Okay. Does everybody get how Starbucks is a good example of engineering the total brand experience? From the product, to the culture, to the physical experience, the uh, interior design, even down to the damn toilet paper. Yeah? Okay, very good. So. Let's answer question number three out of four. Look, we're almost there. See, it wasn't that bad. Okay, so you guys, I went to, well, I gotta tell you, I'm not going to any more concerts anymore because every time I go to a concert, one of my animals dies. I am not kidding. I'm not kidding. What happened to who I So I had two pugs, the loves of my life for like 15 years. Um, both concerts at American Airlines Center too. I went to the Adele concert. My girl dog died the next morning. Oh. And then I went to the Lady Gaga concert, my picture, and my boy dog died the next night. Oh my God. So, so it's like a hex. Yeah. Then I went to another concert and my bunny died. So no more concerts yeah. for me. Maybe you don't oh have me asking. Do you have a house? Do you have a bunny? Like a it's like a concert. Uh, the bunny, they were all really old. Let me just oh, be clear. Oh, bunny okay. was eight. Boy dog was 14. Girl dog was 15. So they were old. But it's just too much of a coincidence that they died after the concert. That's why I'm not going to concerts anymore. All right? Do you have any more pets right now? I have one cat. Oh, okay. He's okay, right. definitely <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the bunny died. Do you know? Yeah, she died. <laughs> She died in the hotel too, which oh, made matters worse. I was living in a hotel. Right, now it's the best. No, it's That's all right. I'm telling you all. RIP. All my, all right, yeah, all my heartbreaks. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, my point is not going to concerts anymore. But um, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, good picture, right? Yeah. So I had a great time at the Lady Gaga concert about a year ago, but or two maybe. Um, it was the total brand experience for me. It was multi-sensory. It was not just auditory. It was, you know how concerts are today. The, the, the lighting is just so sophisticated. It was lights. It was something emotional. There was a connection. It was everything. It was, it was the smell. It was the smoke. It was the rain. It rained in the comp- and It rained on stage. It was all kinds of cool, all right? So I think for an artist, whatever artist, what are, how many guys have been in a concert lately? Yeah, all of you, almost all of you. So for an artist, like, man, you know, putting out a track is kind of like vitamin water selling to Kroger, or like Landa said, the gas station, right? You don't really have a lot of control over the experience. But for an artist to perform live and to get to actually like choreograph and design and the pyrotechnics and the lighting, that's the total brand experience for them. Agree? Mm-hmm. Okay. Another example I can give you is car dealerships. How many of you bought your car from a dealership and you go to the dealership? Okay. Dealerships also like to deliver kind of the toilet paper experience. Yeah? So you go to your dealership and the dealership, the way it's built, and the little fun extras that they do for you, and the type of service they provide to you, and all that kind of stuff. That's part of the total brand experience. Agree? Yeah. Yeah. 
all he end up is charging way more for replacing the bridge than I also will. And is it a bare bones experience at the dealership? I mean, they have Wi-Fi and like a <laughs> couch. Okay. And you know what? I, I guess that is in line with the brand, right? Now, I'll tell you. To be <laughs> my fancy dealership, let me tell you, they hook it up. They have booze, they have beautiful bathrooms, they give you an iPad while you wait. I mean, they have, they hook it up. What kind um, of car do you have, though? Let me not tell you in case any of you want to key my car. <laughs> Let me not tell you. It just sounds like I saw you in your car last week. That makes sense with the brand of car. Okay, so what I'm asking of you guys in, in number three is can you give me an example? I gave you an example, a concert I went to, um, or the car dealership that I go to. Can you give me an example of a musician, an artist, an automobile manufacturer, any company? I don't care what it is that you think delivers a good total brand experience. So it's gotta be, it's gotta deliver on the product, the service, the environment, the, the marketing, the customer service experience. Give me an example of a total brand experience for yourself. I'm gonna okay. say this, and just because I went there yesterday, yep. the Lego store. Cool, the Lego. I can imagine that that's a slam dunk, <laughs> right? Okay, the rest of you cannot use the Lego store. But go ahead and give me your answer number three. Um, example of, to and, and by the way, while you're thinking about it, a total brand experience does stuff like this. It impacts lots of senses. Welcome to Starbucks, it's a smell, it's a sound, right? Under Armour, it has a signature scent. Um, it makes people feel a sudden feel, right? It's a vibe. Um, it makes people want to linger makes people want to use the brand often. It has a strong point of view. It could be exciting or soothing or exhilarating. It conjures up images. Man, I can close my eyes and I can remember both of those concerts. I could tell you the tracks they sung in order. I, I remember it that well, okay? It has the power to take people to a different place. People who are into Starbucks, think of Starbucks as the third place power to transport you to a place, All right? So give me an example of a brand that has delivered the total brand experience for you and tell me how. Like, what about it was the total brand experience? Oh, it's McDonald's rat tail time. Okay. Landis, was that enough warning? It's okay, you told us it was fake, so I'm fine now. <laughs> um, the rat tail is real. It was just planted there by a customer okay, the with a wall. Okay, it wasn't there by their fault. Yeah. Enough. Okay, good. 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 Okay. Give me a friendly head nod when you jotted down your total brand experience experience. It's hot as hell in here, isn't it? Oh. I'm going to open the door. You guys cool with that? I think it's because you have the, oh, the you have projector on, your, on, on you the whole time. Yeah. yeah. You're you're missing missing everything? Everything? I'm not freezing, oh. but I'm not. It's hot as hot. Okay. Everybody ready? Last topic. Not too bad, right? It wasn't that painful. Okay. Last topic. Uh, nobody <laughs> answered. Crisis. Hey, I'm doing all the work. Okay, we're doing four chapters this week, and it's going to be a shorter class than last week, so yeah. I'm fine. Oh, perfect. See that? I, I deliver. Still have to drive back to I deliver. Okay. Crisis management. So, what is a crisis? What is a crisis? Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Things that jeopardize your brand image. An unexpected situation that causes chaos, <laughs> stress. Maybe causes irreparable damage to the brand, at least for the short term. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, crisis could be things like the BP oil spill. Do we all remember that? BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, right? This caused, obviously, irreparable ecological damage. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the brand, the damage that it did to British Petroleum, right? Irreparable damage that we still think of BP as this, like, irresponsible company, right? And then, brace yourself, here it is, ta-da! Um, let me tell you something. <laughs> Thank you for the... <laughs> the genuine uh, response. But if you Google stuff, man, there is a history of 
lawsuits for. I found this at McDonald's, I found that at McDonald's, it was a rat in my burger, there was ground up. There's a lot of, you know, phony baloney lawsuits out there. Some of them are legit, okay? But what I wanna talk about specifically is Domino's Pizza, which is the last question on tonight's thing of a jig. Yep. Someone had to carry that around. Oh, I know. Right. Somebody had to transport the rat's yeah. tail yeah. into like the Mickey D. Like yeah. I, I feel like there's some movie or somewhere where somebody did that. Like, I don't, I I don't even want to know. That's not. I don't even want to know. Like, where did it come from? How did you plant it? Okay. Someone put it in their own food, or they put it in the entire thing? They put it in their own food. And then I guess they, you know, maybe, yeah. You know, it was like the lady who spilled the hot coffee. Okay, that was legit. I know it was. I, I read her whole story. I know. And she actually did have some serious, like, repercussions from it. It was They even legit. lowered the temperature they served their coffee at because it was at, like, a hundred. It yeah. was nuts. It legitimately did, could scald. Did scald and could scald. But, okay. So, before we get into the little um, Domino's case study, I'm going to just show you two quick clips. They're really good. Um, I want to give you kind of like a rule of thumb. And this is something that textbook talks about. I developed this for Wade College too. In the event of the worst, let's not discuss what the worst is, okay? You all know what the worst is on any college campus in the United States. But luckily, we're all safe up in, on the fourth floor of this campus. But in the event of the worst, right, you have a bona fide crisis, something that could potentially hurt your brand. Um, you have to have a crisis plan. Okay, and the crisis plan is basically, I hate to say it this way, but how are we gonna cover our asses, okay? Um, we need to first have approved spokesperson or spokespeople. Who is gonna be the face of the company that deals with the media, okay? Let me tell you guys something. Is that you? It is me, yes, mm -hmm. it is me. I will be the one that gets up there and says, you know, we're triaging bodies and got the <laughs> it's not, it's, Honestly, it's not even funny, not even funny joke. But, um, do you guys remember when the Samsung phones were blowing up and burning everybody on planes? And okay, do you guys know Samsung for literally like three months would not even take requests from media to discuss them? Nobody internally from the company up to the CEO in Korea, South Korea, would, would hold a press conference or say anything. That is the worst type of crisis response you could possibly happen because what happens when you don't take the bull by the horns? What happens when you don't address? Well, they make you that you knew what was gonna happen. Sure, yeah. sure. Or you just allow the media to formulate the buzz and you lose control of directing what the buzz is supposed to be. Okay, so that's the first thing. You gotta have a crisis plan. You have to appoint a spokesperson before the bad shit happens. Are you with me? Before it happens, okay? You gotta think about what are all the things that could go wrong, all right? Conduct a crisis vulnerability audit. That's what I just said. Figure out the stuff that could go wrong. What are the lawsuits? What are the, how are the, what are the ways our product can hurt people? What are the, you know, what are the crises we can find ourselves in? I have a, a Volkswagen example I'm gonna send you home with. How many of you drive a Volkswagen, anybody? Nice, okay, good. Here is the biggest rule of the whole damn thing. When bad thing happens, you gotta own it and you gotta do it fast, okay? That is one thing I'm gonna influence you on this last question. When the bad thing happened at Domino's, you'll see it on the next slide. The CEO responded the next day, okay? I'll let you decide whether you like the response or not, whether you thought it was honest or not, whether you thought it was authentic or not, did it look like the company cared or not, bless you. But at the end of the day, at least Domino's responded the next day. Where am I? It took Samsung three months to address the fact that their phones, that their phones <laughs> were banned from flying. The TSA banned the freaking phones no word from the company, okay? That's bad crisis management, all right? Accept responsibility, that's the other thing. McDonald's accepted the responsibility for the rat's tail. Even though the jury found it very clear that DNA evidence showed the rat didn't even come from the store, it came from somebody bought it. Let people know how the situation will be managed and what will be done, show concern. Okay. So kind of like an apology when they sort say, of. 
they say something dumb, like on social media. I'm sorry, I'm on it, we'll fix it. Yeah. And you say it fast, right? I take response, or we take responsibility. Here's how we're gonna fix it, here's the timeline, okay? And you do that in a way that seems like you actually give a blank loot. <laughs> okay, take this slide, apply it to these two videos. Vital kids. Okay. Oh, I love this so much. Last one, all right? Um, a couple of years ago, these two tool, tools, <laughs> call them tools, all right? <laughs> decided they were gonna be cute, film a little YouTube video hoax at their Domino's employees, and put it on YouTube, morons. Okay? <laughs> I'm gonna show you the video, and then I'm gonna show you the CEO's response which by the way was posted in the exact same format, YouTube video, okay? The next day. And then you can answer number four, but read it now so you know what you're looking for. Ready? Okay, here's, here's the crisis. In a video posted online by two Domino's pizza workers. They claim it was all a harmless prank, but now they're out of work and facing criminal charges. Fair warning, many of you might find the video a little distasteful. Here's NBC's Ron Moss. Hello, this is Christy back again. It's Kitchen Confidential turned Arrested Development. <laughs> but unlike the best-selling book detailing the less than glamorous stuff that goes on in restaurant kitchens, two Domino's pizza workers in North Carolina are in big trouble with the food police and the real police for making this video and posting it on YouTube. This is Italian in the video, one employee sticks cheese up his nose, later even wiping himself with a sponge that was for dishes. All to a running play by play from his seemingly delighted co worker. Michael, such a great star. Yes, he is. In an online statement, Domino's delivered a career ending blow to the pair and a stern warning about the hazards of a web, saying, quote, anyone with a camera and an internet link can cause a lot of damage. 32 year old Michael Setzer and 31 year old Christy Hammonds were fired and charged with distribution of prohibited foods though they insist none of the food in question was ever served to customers. Still, the health department closed the restaurant this week to be sanitized. 125,000 employees around the country, the workforce, um, are, you know, all of them are doing it the right way, and you know, two idiots get to you know, make it a, a really hard day for a lot of us. The two are certainly not the first Baskin workers whose video pranks are in the hot water. Employees at a Burger King in Ohio and a KFC in California did so quite literally, taking a dip in the kitchen sink. The Domino's narrator, Christy Hammonds, apologized to the company in an email. Her mother said she's embarrassed by her daughter's actions and asked that her face be hidden. I thought, well, where in the world did y'all get that? And, you know, she said, well, mom, it's just time, you know, we didn't send up an outfit. I didn't feel like, you know, my name went and I had to, it blew my mind. Yeah. For thought. Now it's ready to be shipped to some unlucky customers. And a harsh lesson learned. Okay. Thank you. For today, Ron Mott, NBC News, Atlanta. Okay, that's the prices. So obviously YouTube video, uh, it got a whole lot of hits, let me just tell you. So lots of public, you know, outrage. Here's the CEO's response. Hello, I'm Patrick Doyle, president of Domino's USA. Recently, we discovered a video of two Domino's team members who thought that their acts would be a funny YouTube hoax. We sincerely apologize for this incident. We thank members of the online community who quickly alerted us and allowed us to take immediate action. Although the individuals in question claim it's a hoax, we are taking this incredibly seriously. This was an isolated incident in Conover, North Carolina. Two team members have been dismissed and there are felony warrants out for their arrest. The store has been shut down and sanitized from top to bottom. There is nothing more important or sacred to us than our customers' trust. We're re-examining all of our hiring practices to make sure that people like this don't make it into our stores. We have auditors across the country in our stores every day of the week making sure that our stores are as clean as they can possibly be and that we're delivering high quality food to our customers 
day in and day out. The independent owner of that store is reeling from the damage that this has caused. And it's not a surprise that this has caused a lot of damage to our brand. It's sickens me that the actions of two individuals could impact our great system where 125,000 men and women work for local business owners around the U.S. and more than 60 countries around the world. We take tremendous pride in crafting delicious food that they deliver to you every day. There are so many people who come forward with messages of support for us, and we want to thank you for hanging in there with us as we work to regain your trust. Thank you. All right. Question is, what do you think? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Seems legit, but then after a while, I felt like he was reading himself. Okay. I think he probably was. Yeah. Yeah, because he was. Telecom. Yeah. But you know, that doesn't bother me as much as the, that he did not like. Uh, or, or I guess like you know he should, but, but in my opinion, he didn't take responsibility as appropriate. He he always just blamed them. I mean, he said, "I'm dealing with it." It's, but he did not take the responsibility. Okay, so to formulate your response for number four, pick a bullet that stood out for you, you know? Um, we'll, we'll all agree the response was very timely. Yeah, it was the next day. You know, and it's a, it's a well-produced video. It's probably, you know, like, they, they moved. Um, did it feel honest? There's no right or wrong answer here, and it's your interpretation. Um, do you think they accepted responsibility? Did they let people know what they were doing? Did they seem concerned? Um, no right or wrong answer, just I'm curious to know how did you interpret it, that's all. Did, do you think it followed, you know, these crisis management steps, okay? Um, finish that up, and then I wanna just tell you real quick before we do our quiz about a discussion topic. Oh, and our project too, yeah, that too, that too. Volkswagen um, had its own crisis a few years ago, all right? Um, kind of lying about diesel engines. Now, I'll just leave it at that. You'll read it in the article. I don't know if anybody remembers it, all right? And so they were, they were caught up in this like drama about these diesel engines and the crisis eventually went away and we forgot. Well, they're launching a new ad campaign now and they're bringing it up again, which seems like the antithesis of like crisis management rules, right? Like once you're done with the crisis, bury it. Agree? Okay. So I'm gonna post um, a discussion board, what do we call those things, forum. Um, I would like for you to read the article, you don't have to do it right now, but um, jump on the discussion forum, please, and answer my little probing question, which I'm basically gonna ask you like, do you think this is a good idea or not? And I, I didn't mean it to come out of my mouth that way. Do you think this is a good idea or not? Okay? I haven't even read the entire article yet, but I will. Um, I'm just curious to get your opinion about digging up drama from the past. Okay? I'm not saying Coke did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that. Look out for that discussion question. Project. All right. So, everybody's gonna write their paper in an outline format, yes? With an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I think it goes up to H, yes? Okay, wanna run through these real fast? You guys have your syllabus with you? If you don't, look on with somebody, or look on Jupiter. Okay, parts A, B, and C, literally just follow the direction. For A, B, and C, I just need a paragraph. A is your research. What are you researching? The airline, the airline industry. industry, beautiful. Yes, tell me, who are the biggest players? What's the volume? Are there any trends you can highlight for me? Is air, air travel increasing? Is it decreasing? 
Um, just give me tidbits that maybe support your airline brand, your concept, okay? I'm not looking for like a research paper, a paragraph, all right, with some interesting pieces of research. Um, maybe if you go to the final project grade, it should be there. Or no, you know what? Yeah, yeah, maybe there, try there. I think it's a separate document from the syllabus. Tell me if you don't see it. Look at materials. For materials? Yes, yeah. thank you. By the way, you know I updated all the syllabi, right? I have like yeah, you know. ages old. I don't know what I was doing. I never just didn't update it. But now you have a new syllabus up there. Okay, part B, you may absolutely embellish part B if I have not identified a target audience that you're interested in. You know, you can add to it, embellish upon it, okay? I just want to know from you a very specific target market that you are trying to appeal to. You've done this before. You've all done marketing projects before. I know you have. And then for part C, um, part C, the project, the project doesn't really apply to this one because we're doing an airline, not a product. Yeah. So I want to know, is your airline, is it a regional carrier? Are you going to focus on certain types of airports, a certain type of region? Is it an international airline? Like, give me a sense of what area it covers. The example I gave you guys a few weeks ago was JetBlue. How many are familiar with JetBlue? JetBlue flies nationally, but they generally, their whole shtick is they only fly to secondary airports. So like, if you're gonna go to New York, the big airport's LaGuardia, well they fly to like Iceland, this like smaller airport. And if you're gonna go to Houston, they go to Houston Hobby instead of George Bush. They, that's their whole thing. They, they, they service like smaller regional airports. Okay. Does your airline have a strategy like that? Okay, part D, literally just state your brand name and then explain what kind of name it is. Is it coined, associative, descriptive, or generic? And just explain it, like we're talking two sentences. Part E, explain your logo. Literally explain. Tell me why is it the colors? Why is it the font? Why is it the design? Why, what, why did you make the decisions that you made? Okay, stop me with questions. Part F, G, and H are literally not even a sentence each. Part F, you're just gonna state adjective, adjective, noun. It's your brand essence. Make sure your noun is not airline, right? How will your brand ever expand beyond airline if your noun is airline, okay? Do not use the word airline. Adjective, adjective, noun. The noun should be, it should describe what the brand is. Yeah. Right? Starbucks is rewarding oh, everyday moments. Moments. I looked this stuff up last night when I was working on it. I don't just know that. Good. <laughs> um, Disney is fun family entertainment. What is your airline? Okay. Um, brand promise. Just literally write that sentence. Only John Conti Airlines delivers, you know, I don't know, clowns on a plane. What, I, what is it? Okay. To who within the, you know, the domestic airline industry, whatever you are. H, literally just give me, I'll take seven, eight, nine adjectives, but the adjectives have to describe a person. Okay. A person. If your airline were a person, what would they be like? Okay, we're almost there. That's H. I and J. I, what is different or better about your airline? What is the unique spin? What is the unique proposition? What is the shtick? What makes your airline needed in the, in the industry? What void are you filling? Answer something like that. Um, I have the place because I love this Please. part. Yeah. Okay. So I would, I would describe, I guess, this says explain who the company competition is. Beautiful. So I wrote like American Airlines. Okay. Like what? Why are they my competition? And yep. What my brand is going to bring differently? Is that okay? Yes. Okay. As long as you're highlighting what makes you either different 
or better, or what boy you're filling, or why you're needed, okay. something, I need something to spin like that. Okay, after that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not enough just to say, I compete against American Airlines and they're the number one carrier. Okay, well, who are you and what void are you filling in the market? Okay. Good? Everybody good? All right. J, the hardest part of the paper, the hardest part of the whole market. What will you do to create emotional connection with the consumer? How will you, first of all, what is it that you want the consumer to feel about your brand? And then how are you going to get them to feel? The how could be pop-up shops, interesting experiences, um, advertise, traditional advertising, digital advertising, some social media, brand ambassadorship. I don't know, come up with cool stuff. Okay, come up with cool stuff to introduce your airline and to get emotional connection from the consumer and walk me through the steps. Answer everything I'm talking about in J, right? Um, I'll make you one last deal. I usually give out cute little map boards. So I'll tell you what, next week in class, be on time at eight o'clock, have your airline, whatever you're doing, your plane cut out Cut it out nice and perfect. I'll give you map board, and you can mat it on the map board in class next week. Okay. Good? I'll bring rubber cement and map board. Cool? So if I, I need to see what your brand is going to look like on, it could be on the plane itself, and however you want to be on the yeah, paper, 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 paper and the, whatever you're gluing yeah. to the map board. And I'll give you a piece of map board and some rubber cement. Cool. And up. I feel like give us an extra week. I know, that's why I thought I was Do you want an extra week? Yes, because I have your test and your project next week, so. Well, don't confuse them, that's a different class. I know, but um, you know, I have two things that I have to do. Would you like another week? Yes. You guys know I'm cool. Yes. You all have been cool. Your attendance <laughs> has been great. Your midterm exams were pretty good. Yes. I'm cool. All right, so. Not next week, the week after? Yes. yes. I'm cool. So then one more question. Yes. Don't leave, we have a quiz. The trade to extension. Yes. Oh, I skipped that. Oh, okay. You want the 21st. That part, do, do, do you want me to put the logo right there and then explain it or the picture? Okay. I'm cool either way. Okay. I'm really looking for an explanation. Okay. So why does your logo look the way it looks? Okay. Um, trade dress is tough with an airline. Okay. Yeah. Unless you're going to go the extra step of creating like, like um, uniforms or something. Yeah. Okay. Which I'm not necessarily yeah. looking for. Okay. okay. Good question. Okay. Anybody else have other questions? You can always email me or Jupiter message me and I will give you some advice. But honestly, if you just answer what I'm asking for and you write this in an outline format with A through J, you should do very well. So don't touch the essay. You can write in paragraphs, but I want there to be A, B, C, D. And then the front page is going to say Labels. our name. Right? Yeah, I'm cool. All right, I will give you guys um, map board next week that you can make gorgeous on your own. I have a question on that. It says on the uh, paper that it's black. Can it be white to the map board? Because I'm asking because like, my product is black. Gotcha. It'll bleed into. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna just honestly, it's whatever I have in the art lab to, to cut is what I'm gonna bring to you. So if I can bring a mix of both, I will. Yeah. Well, that, but that that is what I'm asking. Just to know if I need to put some type of gray outline or something so it stands out. Well, I'll give. Let's see what I give you next week, and then you can you have a week to figure it out. All right. Cool. <laughs> I just literally, I'm just stealing that board from right now. I don't, that's what I'm all I'm doing. And I'm going to cut it for you because I like to hang them in lecture one. Mm -hmm. like Wait, we don't know what size specifically our logo needs. Oh, okay. uh, if you look at lecture one, it's going to look just like all the things all around the walls in lecture one. Okay. It'll be a square, just like that. Okay. This is chapter 12, 13, 14. You may do your thing. Help if I turn the video off, yeah?